Well, I've certainly been blessed the last couple of days to get to spend time with you. I appreciated the Pharisees hosting me and the elders here uh, for lunch yesterday. I know that you know how blessed you are to have these men uh, who shepherd the flock here and care about your souls. Um, Certainly it was a blessing for me to get to spend time with them yesterday. And then last night uh, over at Rachel Copeland's and getting to spend time with a lot of the young adults. And uh, I can tell how much this group loves and appreciates each other, and that's a blessing that I know that you um, are thankful for as well. And then getting to be with Clayton and Sandra this evening, and uh, Clayton's mother um, was going there to the Lamar Church of Christ in Vernon, Alabama when I first moved there in 95, and she was a tremendous blessing to me and Adrian, and it's just good to spend time with them tonight, and um, we're just so blessed, and so many things that we can be grateful for, and I'm thankful for everyone here um, tonight. We're going to continue in our study of prayer, prayer for every season, looking at different prayers from the Bible that we can use as templates and patterns. We have so many patterns in the Bible, patterns for worship, patterns for our lives, for our marriages, for our homes. Uh, And we have patterns for prayer uh, that God has given us. He's given us the very words to say. The the disciples came to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus didn't say, oh, well, there's nothing to it. Prayer is just talking to God. You know, even a child can pray, which is true. And some of the most beautiful prayers you'll ever hear come from a child's lips. No, Jesus taught them. He gave them a pattern. He gave them a model prayer to pray. And There are so many models that we have in Scripture, and we're just touching on a very few of them in this this series. But we're looking at different seasons of life. Yesterday we looked at depression and sin. Tonight, uh, well, it should be opposite. It's going to be envy tonight, and then worry tomorrow night, and then spiritual growth on uh, Wednesday night. We're going to be looking at Psalm 73 and talking about envy. And before we read the psalm, I want to just say a few things about envy. Envy is one of the most destructive emotions uh, within us. Proverbs 27 and verse 4, Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who can stand before envy? Envy destroys everything in its wake. Uh, Lifelong friendships, marriages... Careers have been ruined. Churches have been split. Envy is deadly. It is a killer. And envy feeds on the basest emotions in us, selfishness and pride. It's really a form of idolatry, the idolatry of self. Self is put at the center, and anything that threatens our idol. Uh, we look at it as blasphemy against our God. The irony is is that this devotion to self keeps us from enjoying the the pleasure or power that we're seeking. You think about uh, Haman and the story of Esther. He was given that invitation to come and eat at the queen's table, and he comes home with so much joy. And yet when he sees Mordecai, refusing to bow before him or to show any kind of honor or reverence to him. It infuriates him. And so he comes home and Haman recounted to them, his family and friends, the splendor of his riches, the number of all of his sons, all the promotions with which the king had honored him and how he advanced him above the officials and the servants of the king Then Haman said, even Queen Esther, let no one but me come with the king to the feast she prepared. And tomorrow also I am invited by her together with the king. Yet all of this, he said, is worth nothing to me. So long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Isn't Isn't that how envy works? Everything in our life can be going so well, we can be so blessed by God with a good marriage, with good children, with a a good uh, career, with a a 
family of Christians at church that support us and love us, and yet if we see somebody else who we feel is just a little bit ahead of us, or if we think that they think that they're a little bit ahead of us, in any way, we can enjoy the blessings God has given to us. Envy is essentially a spiritual failure where we are despising and rejecting God's will. Uh, You think about examples of envy in the, the Bible. Cain, driven by a jealous rage, killed his own brother. And do you remember what God said to him or what he asked him when he came to him? He said, Cain, why are you angry? And on the surface of it, you might think, well, he's angry because of his brother. But he's not really angry at his brother. He's angry at God. He's despised the fact that God has accepted his his brother's offering and rejected his. Uh, Rachel and Leah, those two sisters, whom I think we all feel a little bit sorry for because of the circumstances. I couldn't imagine an arrangement like that. It seems unfair, and you almost want to give them a pass until they start having children. They even name those children after the competition that they're in. And there is Leah, who is blessed by God with four sons. In chapter 30 and verse 1, it says that her sister Rachel burned with envy, despising the very blessings that God had given to her sister. It's like so many of us. We can't rejoice in the blessings of God because we're so consumed with ourselves. And then what about Saul? Here is Saul who has been blessed by God with a man to not only kill and slay the giant Goliath, but has led his armies in many victories against God's enemies, the Philistines. And yet when he hears the songs that the women are singing, Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands. It's almost like us. Well, how did she get a hundred likes on her pictures of her grandchildren when I only got ten likes on my pictures? We're really no different, are we? And then we look at the older brother, of the prodigal, and really the, the parable of the prodigal is about him and his relationship with the father. There were two sons in this parable that were lost. Only when the, the bad son, the prodigal son, comes home and his father throws this great feast, the older brother is sitting outside, won't even come in. And the father goes in to him and, and, and asks him uh, to come in. And yet the brother is burning with righteous indignation, or at least he feels it's righteous indignation. And that's often what envy does. It disguises itself as righteous. Won't even accept his brother anymore. He says, this son of yours has gone out and and wasted uh, all your inheritance with harlots, and you won't even kill the fat, you won't even kill a young goat for me, and you kill the fatted calf for him. Again, Just like Cain, he wasn't angry at his brother. He was angry at his father. And then the chief priests and the elders. Ultimately, Jesus was put to death. He hung on a cross because man was filled with envy. And they literally rejected the greatest blessing God ever gave to mankind. His only begotten Son. That's what envy does to us. It is the worship of self. Envy is a symptom of a much deeper problem. Psalm 73 is the introduction to the book, to book 3 in the Psalms, um, which is said by some, the, the Psalms, you know, come in five books. And some believe that these books correspond to the five books of the law. 
And if that's true, then book 3 corresponds to Leviticus, which of course is all about the tabernacle. And Asaph finds the solution to envy when he comes before God in worship. This is really the key to this psalm, Psalm 73, and to envy. What what ultimately drove out envy in Asaph's heart was true worship. When he came into the sanctuary of God, everything was put into proper perspective. And so with that in mind, let's let's read Psalm 73 together. The beginning of book 3, Psalm 73. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore pride is their necklace, violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness, their hearts overflow with follies, they scoff and speak with malice, loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked. Always at ease, they increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. And so there's two parts to this psalm. The first 15 verses speak of the source of envy. And then the last half, verses 16 through 28 talk about the solution to envy. So we're going to talk about these two parts, and then at the end we'll make some uh, applications. He begins the psalm with really the theme, the thesis statement, you might say, and the conclusion of what this psalm is all about. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Uh, But he goes on in verse 2 to say, but as for me, he knows that this is true. This is the conclusion that God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But he didn't see this. He says, as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And he uses the Hebrew word shalom here. It's translated prosperity in our, in our English Bibles, but uh, usually this word is translated peace. Although peace doesn't really fully capture this word shalom. Uh, shalom means completion or fulfillment. 
Uh, it implies a wholeness or harmony, not just the absence of hostility. It's not just the absence of, of war or fighting. It's often used of just physical well-being, like good health. It really summarized, in one word, the benefits that were provided in the covenant. All the blessings that God promised to those who were faithful to Him, to those who kept His commandments. And nearly two-thirds of its occurrences in the Old Testament relate to the fulfillment of God's blessings to His people. But think about that. Shalom is promised to whom? To those who keep God's commandments. Do you see the problem here? In his mind, here I am trying to do everything that God has commanded me, and yet I'm not seeing shalom. I'm not seeing peace in my life. It's the wicked and the arrogant that are experiencing this prosperity that are experiencing this wholeness. That doesn't seem right to him. And so he is envious of them. He talks about their blessed uh, lives. In verse 4 he says, They have no pangs, I'm sorry, They have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They're fat and happy, you might say. They're well fed. They're well taken care of. They're not in trouble as others are. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. They don't have any worries. They don't have any cares. In verse 6, he says, therefore, pride is their necklace. How do they interpret their prosperity? Oh, well, God must be really happy with me. Look at me. Look at all that I have. Look at my flocks and herds. Look at my uh, relationships with others. Look at my family. Look at all my sons and daughters. Surely I must be doing something right. And they, they, they're filled with pride. Violence, he says, covers them as a garment. They're, they're made to feel like they have the right to take advantage of others. Uh, to, to force and intimidate and, and to try to coerce others into doing their will because they believe that they are God's gift to mankind and they can just get away with murder. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff. And speak with malice, loftily they threaten oppression, pushing others around, intimidating others. They set their mouths even against the heavens. They're not just so bold as to look down on others. They even speak of heavenly beings, even God Himself. And their tongue struts through the earth. And verse 10, therefore His people turn back to them. Which is to say they gain a following. Because they're so confident and, they, and they, they have this air of superiority that attracts others to them. Uh, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. No one seems to realize what's going on. Why are all these people following these wicked men? Is what he's thinking in his heart. And this is the worst thing in verse 11. They say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? We're going to be looking at Psalm 139 tomorrow night where we see that God knows everything and sees everyone. And yet the wicked don't believe that. The wicked think that they can get away with murder, literally. That they can oppress the fatherless and the widow. That they can push push around and intimidate others and that there will be no consequences for them because they're really above the law. No, they don't fear man and they don't fear God. And yet they're so seemingly blessed with shalom, with peace, with prosperity. He says in verse 12, Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. And his conclusion in verse 13 is that it isn't worth serving God. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. Why am I working so hard to be a good man? Why am I trying so hard to treat people with justice and fairness? Why should I be nice to others and show kindness and hospitality? Why should I be the one who turns the other cheek and and does the right thing and shows meekness and, and consideration of others when I'm not being blessed by it? There's no obvious benefit to that. And those who are cutting corners, those who are breaking God's commandments, are blessed 
They're the ones who are receiving all that God promised in His covenant. In verse 14, he says, For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. But then he says in verse 15, If I had said, I will speak thus. And what he's talking about, if I had allowed these thoughts that were in my mind to come out my lips and and really tell people how I felt about God, how I felt about the wicked, how I felt about this unfairness. He said, if I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. And let me just stop and say, well, this will be part of the application at the end, but let me just stop and say, we need to be careful what we say when we're angry. We need to be very careful when we feel like things are not fair and we're starting to have a pity party on ourselves. We need to be careful what we say about God because we may regret it later. We will regret it later if we don't repent. But we may regret the things someday that we've said around our children. Children see things as black and white. And when they grow up in a home where all they hear is about how unfair things are, guess what happens to those children when they grow up? Are they thankful for God's blessings? Or do they tend to interpret everything the way things have been interpreted in their home all along? I think we're... we're, we're, we're Uh, suffering in many ways today, simply reaping what we have sown. We need to be careful about what we say, uh, especially around those who are young. If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But he didn't. And the reason why he didn't is because finally he came back to the proper orientation and the proper perspective of things. In verse 16, this is where we make the transition to the solution to envy. In verse 16, he says, But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to be to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. (coughs) Then I discerned their end. What was the solution to his envy? What was the solution to his discontent? It was when he came into the presence of God. Worship was the answer. Viewing things from the divine perspective, seeing things the way God sees them, understanding that God is still in control, understanding that God is on his throne, understanding that God is ultimately going to make things right in the end, brought him back to the proper perspective of things. He had been looking things, looking at things through the wrong lens. He had been looking at things as men see things, not by the way God sees things. And by coming before God and worshiped, he regained the proper orientation before the presence of God. In verse 18, he says, Truly you set them in slippery places. They seem to be very uh, secure, they seem to have it all together. Uh, They seemed to be very confident and secure in themselves, but he knew better. He knew that they were standing on shaky ground, that they were standing in slippery places. Because you make them fall to ruin. Their day is coming. They have not been following God. They have been living by their own standards, by their own will. They have been rejecting the knowledge of God. And their day was coming because that same covenant that promised all the blessings for righteousness also promised certain curses for those who rejected God. Verse 19, how they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakes. Oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. Have you ever had a nightmare? A really scary, terrible dream? But how quickly that's over. The terror is over as soon as you wake up. This is just a bad dream. This life is what he's saying, is is just like a bad dream. It's just a phantom, quickly passing away. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. I was just thinking like a pure animal. I was just acting on my basest emotions. 
not thinking critically about what I was feeling. And that's the problem when we're emotional. We're neglecting the, God, the, the God-given gift of, of our intellect and thinking about things logically, thinking about things through God's perspective, thinking about things through what He has promised in His Word. We're just thinking like mere animals based on our own instincts when we are filled with envy. Um, and then in verse 23... After he has come before God, after he has entered the sanctuary of God, after he has realized what truly is important, what really matters in this life, he turns to thanksgiving. He goes from feeling self pity, from feeling sorry for himself, to giving thanks for the blessing that he had. He says in verse 23, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Verse 25, Whom have I, have in, uh, have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart my portion forever. How beautiful. What could you compare to that? What would you want besides that? Do the wicked have that? Oh, they have their nice houses and they have their fancy cars and they have the status and the prestige of men. They're, 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 in, the head, they, they're in the spotlight. They're receiving all the praise of men. But we all know that that's worthless. It doesn't matter. We would trade all of that and more to have a relationship with God. There's nothing more important than that. And when we see things from that perspective, the envy just goes away. It feels foolish to us when we come into the presence of God. How could I be so ungrateful to allow something so small and so trivial to cause my heart to forget of how blessed I truly am. Verse 27, For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you, you, but for me it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your words. Can we say amen to that? Isn't that what it's all about? Well, how do we deal with envy? Let me suggest three things. First of all, we need to pray. We need to pray. I want you to turn over to Psalm 4 for just a moment. Psalm 4 is quoted in Ephesians 4. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your wrath. Listen to how the original quotation reads in Psalm 4 and verse 4. What do you do when you're angry? I've heard and I've said as a preacher sometimes when talking about marriage, if you're angry with your spouse, you need to just... If you're not going to let the sun go down in your wrath, you, you just need to stay up as long as you can... And get it sorted out. Even if if it means talking all night. The problem with that, though, is communication may not always be the, the solution. Or, let me put it this way. We may not be ready to communicate in the proper way. A lot of times when we stay up all night talking, we just stay up all night arguing. And nothing gets done through arguing. Listen to what Psalm 4 and verse 4 says. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. It doesn't say anything about communication there, does it? It says keep your mouth shut. Verse 5, offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. Here's what he's saying. When you're angry, what you need to do is you need to come to God with your anger. 
You need to stop arguing with your wife. You need to stop trying to prove yourself right to your husband. And you need to take all your anger and bring it before the throne of God. Keep your mouth shut. Come before God in silence and let Him deal with your anger. And hear God say to you what He asked Cain. Why are you angry? Why are you angry, Cain? Is your anger at your husband? Is your anger at your wife? Or are you really angry at me? Are you angry because this ugly thing called envy has come up in your heart? And you're upset because what this has done to you. We need to be careful not to just vent our emotions without first sanctifying those emotions. And now, there, there is such a thing as righteous indignation. But righteous indignation is a hard thing to pull off. Righteous indignation can start that way and quickly become selfish indignation, where the point is not about God. The, it's not about the principle of the thing. It's not about obeying God's word. It's that I've been inconvenienced by this. And I'm mad because of what you've done to me and how you've offended me. That's what righteous indignation can easily become if we don't first take our anger to the Lord and let Him give us the proper orientation and how we really ought to feel. And I tell you what, I've done this not as often as I should, but when I followed my own advice and practiced what I preached and gone to God in prayer before I continued the disagreement with my wife, more times than not, when I've done that, I go and apologize. More times than not, I apologize. And so bring your envy to the throne. Secondly, trust in what God says, not in what you see. We tend to focus way too much on what the eye sees. Look over at Luke chapter 15. We related the parable of the prodigal just a moment ago. And I want you to notice what the father says to the older brother. Verse 25, Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry. And refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And can you hear the anger toward his father? It's not really about the brother, it's about the father, isn't it? But listen to what the father said. He said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. That's the point right there. You are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. You see, we suffer when we get into the comparison game. We say, well, why? Oh, she must think she's all that because she has this and she has that. And oh, he must think he's wonderful because he can get up there and do all these things. I'll tell you, one of the worst things can happen to me, and this has happened on more than one occasion, I'm ashamed to say. Um, I don't often feel envious of preachers who are older than me or preachers that are younger than me. It's when someone comes in for a gospel meeting like this who's my age. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe not as a preacher, but you you know what I'm talking about? Someone whom you see as your peer. That was the problem with Rachel and Leah. They were looking at each other eye to eye, and they felt this competition. But everybody's talking about how wonderful this preacher is, and oh, that sermon just changed my life, and that's the best sermon I've ever heard. And guess what I'm thinking in my prideful heart? Well, I'm I'm a pretty good preacher, aren't I? What about me? It's disgusting, isn't it? And that's what the older brother's doing here. Saying this isn't fair. This isn't right. Why should he get to have a party? 
Well, I mean, what about me? I've been working all these years. Don't I deserve that? You hear what the father's saying? The first thing he says is, Son, you are always with me. Isn't that the conclusion of Psalm 73? Whom have I in heaven but you? What can I desire on earth besides you? He's saying, Son, you have me, and everything I have is yours. What more could you want? He's despising the blessings of his Father. And that's what we're doing. I should be thanking God for every preacher, I don't care what age he is, who's better than me. I should be thanking God for anybody I see who is doing God's work. And whatever that is, whether it's preaching or teaching or song leading or whatever it is, in serving, whatever it is, we should be thanking God, not feeling like we have to somehow prove ourselves to anybody. We should simply be thankful that we're God's children and trust in what God says. God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What more do we need than that? Who cares about the cars and the houses and the, and the careers and the, and the families and the children and the husbands and wives? Who, who cares about all of that? Why do we need Facebook to build up our shallow egos with all of these likes and shares and things like that? Why do we need all that? Amen. When God has said, you are mine, you are my treasured possession, what else do we need besides that? Trust in what God says, not what you see. And then finally... Hide your envy and display your blessings before others. Remember what he said in verse 14? For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. If I had just told everybody how bad things were and how, oh, woe is me. You know, God's forgotten me. God's blessing all these wicked people and it doesn't pay off to serve God. If I had just grumbled and complained like we so often do, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But he ends the psalm saying, I didn't do that. Verse 28, But for me it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge. Why? That I may tell of all your works. That's that's what we ought to be doing. And that will cure envy in our heart. If instead of thinking about all the things that we don't have, if we'll focus on what we do have and give thanks to God for all of those things, even the things that other people have that we don't, if we'll simply give thanks to God and let it be about Him and not about us, envy won't be a problem at all. And so may God help us. I'm preaching to myself. I hope you understand. It's a problem for all of us. But we're going to end tonight with a song asking a question that this psalm is really all about. Whom have I have in heaven but you? I think I've told this story to this audience again, but I'm going to tell it again because it fits with this song and the message. The story about the girl with the pearls. Have I told you that story before? It's, uh, it's about a little girl who uh, saw these pearls in a uh, dollar store, and she asked her mom if she could buy them. And her mom said, well, it's $1.95. If you'll save your money, you can get it. This is a long time ago. And so she saved all of her money, her birthday money, and worked chores around the house. And finally she got enough money and she went and bought that string of pearls. And they, they were her pride and joy. She wore them all the time, even to bed. Well, one night she, uh, her father came in. He'd read her a story every night. And he got finished with the story. And at the end, he said, honey, would you give me your pearls? And she said, oh, Daddy, you know how I love my pearls. Please don't ask me for that. She really loved her father and didn't want to disappoint or ever tell him no. She said, please don't ask me for my pearls. And he said, it's okay. Daddy loves you. He kissed her goodnight and tucked her into bed and left. Came in the next night and same routine. He read her a story. At the end, he said, honey, would you give me your pearls? And she said, 
Daddy, please, please, you can have my teddy bear, you can have my baby doll, just anything but my pearls. He said, it's okay, your daddy loves you. Kissed her goodnight and put her to bed. Well, the next night he came in and she was obviously upset. She had her head down, she was crying. And he said, honey, what's the matter? And without saying a word, she just simply held out her pearls and said, here, daddy, you can have them. Well, as he went over there to take the pearls from her, he reached into his pocket and he pulled out a velvet case with a genuine strand of real pearls and gave it to her. And you understand the moral of the story, right? This is the pearl of great price. But he was waiting for her to give up the junk, the fake, to give her the real thing. And the question for you is, what are you hanging on to? That's preventing God from giving you the pearl of great price. What you were made for. When that man saw the pearl, he sold all that he had. What would we not give to have that? Maybe you've been feeling envious of others. Because you have been, you have been living with, under the impression that your identity is fully all about how many children you have or, or your husband or your wife or your career. You, you think that that is, the, that is the foundation to your whole identity. Well, let me tell you something. That is all sand. It's all passing away. It, it, is, a, it is a reflection of what God wants to give us in, the, in these relationships that we have. But it's, it's not the real thing. You were made for something much better. So take your eye off of those things and receive the gift that God can only give you in Jesus Christ. And so do you know my Jesus? Do you know my friend? So why not tonight decide that you're going to accept this gift by repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Jesus Christ, being baptized for the remission of your sins, and God will give it to you. And you can walk out of here never needing to compare yourself to anybody else ever again because you have the only thing that matters. And so if you're subject to this invitation, why don't you come as we stand and sing. Uh-huh.